me the option to do anything other than sign in, but I don't have a password. So are you giving me a password, Peter? No, you're, you're in. I know you think I'm in, but I'm telling you I'm not in. <laughs> you could hear me. I get that, but I'm not in. I could see you, but I can't get my picture to pop up. It's telling me I have to enter an email address and enter a password. Let me try to put in an email address and see what happens. Okay. And now it's answering me for a password. I don't have a password. I don't even, you know. Okay, bear with me, let me. Okay. Unscrew that thing. Unscrew that at the top off cap and give it to me. Bring it over here. Bring it over here. You do that off, please. You cannot start video because the host has stopped it. Who set this up for you, dude?
Peter, I'm getting the same message that Todd got, but I can't turn my video on because the host has stopped it. Yeah, I'm trying to, um, let's see. Hold on, I'm gonna hang up here. Does, does that do anything? Nope. You cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. it just a pop yeah, up. Mine's saying the same thing. Okay, let me let me work on that. Hold on a second. Can you see me? Yes, I can. Yeah. Okay. All yeah, right. me to me as well. David, you're on. I am. I'm here. Okay.
All right, it's working. We're on. Peter, thank you very much. Uh, I needed a little bit of adrenaline rush and you just gave it to me. So I appreciate oh, it. I was going to say the same thing. I'm like, hey, listen, don't worry about it. You know, nobody's got any pressure on them. It's, it's okay. <laughs> you guys got me sweating over here like, oh. <laughs> Too funny. Peter, I assume you will start your live stream. Yes, sir. I'm going to go ahead and um, we'll attempt that. Works. Hopefully that works. Let's see. Okay. Chuck will be happy to know that when you type in Coldwell Banker West, Coldwell Banker Associated Brokers pops up first. Okay, it's 11 o'clock and um, streaming has started, Todd, so. All right, awesome. Well, welcomes, welcome to the Coldwell Banker uh, speaker series. You know, I think by this point, uh, we all know that in order to get speakers like we've gotten for the last two weeks and the speakers that we've got today and this week and next week, it takes a lot of people rowing the boat in the right direction. Um, and frankly, there, there are a lot, of, whether we're talking about mastermind groups or chairman circle groups, frankly, there's too, probably too many for me to actually thank here, but there have been a few that have really done some exceptional work. And I want to make sure I give a special shout out to them before we introduce today's speakers, um, notably, obviously my team, the Coldwell Banker Distinctive Properties uh, and Canyonside Properties in Idaho, Montana and Colorado, uh, Peter Mendiola, of course, of Coldwell Banker West in San Diego. Chuck Whitehead from CB Associated Brokers, also in Southern California. Mike Carter with Coldwell Banker Legacy in New Mexico and Texas. Sean Blankenship from Coldwell Banker Collins Murray in Tennessee. Uh, Mike Pradell with Coldwell Banker, the real estate group, and they're everywhere, Indiana, Wisconsin, uh, you name it. Uh, and then of course, Rick Gregory of CB Advantage. Thank you gentlemen very, very much. Uh, your support and your hard work has been amazing and uh, frankly has made all this stuff possible. A um, couple of business items here. Uh, we have two different options here. Uh, number one, you're gonna be on Zoom. Some of you are watching this on Facebook Live. Um, if you're on Facebook Live, you will simply put your questions and your comments um, in the comments section on Facebook. If you are on um, Zoom, uh, please put your comments in the chat box and your questions in the Q&A area. Peter will be monitoring the questions and bringing those to both David and, and Steve as, as we come. So uh, with that, um, if, if for some reason, folks, if we don't get to all of the questions for whatever reason, we will get to them after the fact. Just, just rest assured whether or not David or, or, or Steve, we'll, we'll make sure that we get the questions to them and, and get the answers. So uh, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and make some introductions. Uh, Frankly, I don't really think I need to give any introductions. Um, this is Keeping Current Matters. If you don't know who these guys are, uh, either you're not in the real estate business or you've been living under a rock, but I am going to simply give the, the, the obligatory, uh, David's been in the real estate industry for 20 years, plus he's the vice president of content curation. Uh, he's, he's served in a bunch of different capacities within the real estate industry. Uh, we obviously know Steve. Uh, Steve has served in a bunch of different capacities as well for more than 25 years. He is the co-founder of Keeping Current Matters. He is the oracle as we know him today uh, when it comes to real estate economics. Uh, but, but I think I wanted to really tell just a quick little story because while these guys are as smart as they come, that's not why they're here. Um, that's not why we're here to listen to them. These guys have a passion and a heart for what they do. And, and, and I think this little story, if you'll bear with me, will, will explain to you just to what lengths these gentlemen are willing to go to make sure that they help real estate, the industry as a whole, explain what's going on um, economically. 
a couple of years ago, each year we, like many of the companies represented here, do a leadership summit. I had made a phone call and asked, hey, Steve, would you mind, you know, just, you know, call in or maybe a video in and, and between David and Steve, I got a phone call back saying, hey, listen, we would love to present at your leadership summit, but we're going to go 10 hours out of our way so that we can meet face to face with your people because it's that important to their mission. That's the kind of heart that we're talking about. So with that, please welcome Steve Harney, David Childers, Keeping Current Matters. Thanks, guys. Thank you very, very much, Todd, and thank you everyone that's on the call. Um, Peter, thanks a lot for getting us online. I appreciate that. A lot of us get a little nervous there, so I appreciate everyone's <laughs> patience on that part of it. And, and David, I'm glad that we had plan B just in case everything wasn't gonna work out, we'd make it an audio. So I, I love the fact that everyone jumped in here. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I want to start this off by saying uh, I don't want you thinking I'm being dismissive, dismissive about the health crisis we have in the country right now. I want everyone to know if you haven't been able to tell from my accent that I grew up in New York City. I saw have friends and family there. One of my good friends' mom died of the coronavirus about two weeks ago. And one of the KCM uh, crew, their mother is currently up in New York fighting the disease. So we're very, very personally involved with a lot of people that are, are, are feeling the pain of that pandemic. So I don't want you thinking we're dismissing that. However, I also know that in all probability, there is no one on this call that's gonna come up with the vaccine or even the treatment. So what I wanna really concentrate on is controlling the things that are within our control, because there are really two different crises in the country right now. One being the health crisis, the other one being an economic crisis. Because the country shut down in order to help along with the, the health crisis, the economy is you know, really rocking right now, rattling right now. And it's our responsibility, our professional responsibility as realtors to help bring that economy back. And I will say more than that, I believe it's our moral obligation to do that. The last thing any of these families need after coming through something that um, was devastating to them is to have a second challenge in their life from a financial standpoint. In order to drive this economy back, this is what I know. Housing has to come back, both new construction and resale. And I know the people on this call are the best team of agents across the country to enable us to do that. So what we're going to do today is we're gonna do two things. We're gonna tell you the truth, exactly what's happening as we see it, and as uh, the studies and the research we've done have taught us, and we're gonna trust your intelligence. And I think that you should do the same with your clients. You wanna make sure you're telling them the truth and trust their intelligence. And when you see this, I think you're gonna see that the truth isn't as bad as what the newspapers are saying. The truth isn't as bad as what the headlines are saying. But let's get started, David. Right now, what we wanna to do today is answer five questions that I think that uh, you're faced with every single day. So Dave is going to bring up the presentation. All right, the biggest questions in the real estate market right now, okay, today. Question number one of those five questions, pretty simply, is when is the economy going to come back? When is it going to recover? Question number two, are we going into a recession? Are we already in one? Question number three, is this going to be 2008 all over again? And question number four, what about all those job losses? We're gonna cover all four of these questions. These are questions your consumers are asking you right now, and we wanna be on top of those questions, all right? And we want you to be able to be on top of those questions too, to feel comfortable when your consumer does ask that, whether it be a buyer or a seller, that you have the answers, because they're looking to you for the answers. Understand when we're talking about financing, ladies and gentlemen, and this is crucially important, we are, we are financial advisors to them. To the vast majority of the clients we serve, their house is the largest financial investment they've made. It's the largest financial asset they have. So we have to be on top of that and be able to help them through this process. And the last question is a question directly each one of us has to answer. What do you or what do I need to do you know, as we move forward? Okay, first off, let me tell you that Google just put out to all their marketing companies, the data tells us people are looking for two things right now help and comfort. If you're able to help them to navigate the current situation, tell them about that. And I will implore everyone on this call, 
whatever you could do within your market. And I know there are some markets that you're relatively free, some markets you have one hand tied behind your back. There are some markets that you have both hands tied behind your back. But whatever you can do to help those people in the process of either listing or selling a house, we have to step up to do that. Think like a caring human being with the resources to help millions. Make believe that's who you are, then act accordingly and the mutual interests of business and society. I'm not suggesting that we break any protocol. I'm not suggesting we do anything that's unsafe. What I'm suggesting is within the protocol, within the safety guidelines, that we do everything we can. My fear is that there are some agents that are a little bit nervous about doing something right now. A bigger fear is we have some agents so nervous they're hiding under their bed right now. So I applaud every single person that's on this call because you've taken the, one of the first steps to say, no, I'm gonna do something about this. I'm not gonna be a victim to this situation. I'm gonna be one of the heroes to help everyone else out. And again, I applaud you for that. Now, when we're talking about the economy, when is the economy gonna recover? I can let you know that I looked it up. There are 18,650 economists in this country. And every one of them have an has an opinion. As a matter of fact, there's about 19,000 opinions because I've actually watched interviews where an economist has changed their opinion during the interview, <laughs> all right? But there's all sorts of terms being thrown about. Basically, there's a view, a V, a U, and a Y. V means we're gonna go down hard and come right back. U means we're gonna go down, stay down a little bit and then come back. W means we're gonna go down, bounce a little bit and come back. They've come up with new things, a check mark. No one really knows what that means, but people are talking about it. A tech recovery, a Nike switch recovery. I'm not sure if Nike came up with that just to get into the mix. I'm not really sure. But there's all different uh, things being said right now. And that's because the economists are having a tough time. And let's not beat them up about that. Understand, and David, go to the next slide. Usually what an economist does is they look at the business science. How has the economy rebounded from similar slowdowns in the past? What about all the pandemics? Well, you know, what happened in 1918? You know, all those things they would look at. But right now, they actually have to layer on top of that the health science, not just the business science. Well, when will the COVID-19 be under control? When will, be another, will there be another flare up of the virus this fall? So instead of just dealing with the business science they're used to dealing with, they now have to do the business science and the health science. And then on top of that, they have to layer in the social science. After businesses are fully operational, how long will it take American consumers to return to normal consumption patterns? Example, going to the movies, attending a sporting event, or even flying. So what an economist has to do right now, and the reason they're all over the map about what kind of recovery is gonna be, is they have to layer each one of these things, one on top of the other, and that makes it extremely difficult. Well, and Steve, can I inter interrupt for just one sure. second? So, so for those of you on this call, uh, whether you're on Facebook or whether you're on the Zoom, um, in the chat box, well, put what you think it's going to be. Like, do you think it's a V? Do you think it's a W? Do you think it's the night? I love it. Just do it. That's, that's too good. <clears throat> <laughs> okay. Now, the one that I don't want anyone to put in the box was this is definitely not going to happen. The only one we really have to worry about is an L recovery. An L recovery means it, go, it goes down and it just stays there for years and years. That's not going to happen. There's no economist calling for an L recovery right now because that's what happened in 2007, 2008. It went down and it stayed down for a long period of time. From 2008, almost all the way up to 2013, we struggled through that. As a matter of fact, unemployment, which David will talk to in a second, actually struggled nine years out from that. All right. That's not what we're talking about now. What I will tell you, the research has shown, so the people who like the science of everything, this is what the research has shown. Zillow did a, um, a research study and found that during epidemics, such as the 1918 influenza or the 2003 SARS outbreaks, and for the people who don't know, in 1918, 650,000 Americans died. So like, it was even worse than this. But studying those, economic activity fell sharply during the epidemic, as it has today, but snap back quickly once the epidemic was over. John Burns Consulting, their research team, did the exact same study on, you know, using their data, and historical analysis showed that pandemics are usually V-shaped. Sharp recessions are recovered quickly enough to provide little damage to home prices. And ladies and gentlemen, I can tell you the projections going forward don't talk about any depreciation of home prices. And then the Harvard Business Review just came out 
saying V-shapes monopolize the empirical landscape of prior shocks, including epidemics such as SARS, the 1968 H3N2 flu, 1958 H2N2 flu, and the 1918 Spanish flu. All right, so what do we know? The science, the research behind past uh, pandemics has shown that it is a V-shaped recovery. Now, before you go to the next slide, David, I just want to let everyone know. Matter of fact, bring it to me if you could, David, then go back. Is that possible? Mm -hmm. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the way it, it kind of works. All right. Many of your clients, especially in the second home market, in the luxury market, in, you know, in, in parts of San Diego and parts of across the whole country, they have access to certain situations. And we all wish we had that access. So heaven forbid someone in our family was diagnosed with cancer. We'd want to get the best medical of the, uh, uh, help that we possibly could for our loved one. All right, so we would go look and maybe we knew somebody in a hospital or somebody connected. And we'd say, we want really the best you know, oncologist available. And usually what we would find is the best oncologist is surrounded by a great team. They have a great nutritionist. They have a great radiologist. They have a great chemo team. And that team together provides the best medical advice money can buy. Now, maybe we can afford it. Maybe we can't. But that's what it is. That's what we call them in this country. The best advice money can buy. And the well-to-do, take advantage of it. And every, all the rest of us try to say, well, can we maybe take advantage of it? Heaven forbid one of my children, one of my sons, was falsely accused of a crime. I wouldn't want to hire any attorney. I'd want to try to get the best attorney possible, someone who had a team around them, someone who had that DNA specialist, that handwriting specialist, a, a psychologist that can look at the jury and determine, you know, how might they lean one way or the other on jury selection. That team makes that attorney a really, really good attorney. It's the best legal advice money can buy. Well, ladies and gentlemen, it's no different here. The wealthy look for the best financial advice money can buy. And where they get that advice is from the big financial institutions, the Goldman Sachs, the Morgan Stanleys, the uh, JP Morgans, the Wells Fargo Investment uh, term, firm. Those are where they get their advice from. And what I want to show you right now is what advice they're getting. So put that next slide up. The major financial institutions are calling for a V-shaped recovery. So I already told you that a lot of economists are calling for all sorts of things. But those economists don't have teams around them. Each one of these firms not only have an epidemiologist either on staff or on retainer or available to them whenever they want it, they also have teams of people all over the world that are dealing with the Asian market, dealing with the European market. They've had that for years. So if we want to see what's happening in China going forward, if we want to see what's happening in Europe going forward, because they're a little bit ahead of us, these people don't have to go do research. They have to get on a Zoom call with one of their buddies, one of their partners in the firm, and say, all right, tell me what's happening in, in Asia right now, specifically what's happening in China right now. They have the team, just like that great attorney, just like that great oncologist, they have a team. This is the best financial uh, advice money can buy. And how do we know that? Because these four firms handle trillions of dollars. So I want to let you know that this is good advice anyway. And I also want everyone to know in the second market, in the luxury market, in the vacation market, your clients are listening to these people. This is the advice they're getting. That's what we're seeing. And no matter where we do a report, we're seeing in the upper end market that 3 million and above, all of a sudden there's a lot of movement there because the people are hearing that, hey, listen, this is an opportunity right now. Now there's many reasons for that. You know, people want to get away from the, you know, the density populations into a, a, a different place. There's all sorts of situations that will, uh, history will prove caused that to happen. But one of the major things is this right here. The advice they're getting is that looks, it looks like it's going to be good. Now at the same time, as you know, these four firms are saying, hey, listen, it's going to be a V-shaped. It's going to come back pretty quick. All right. At the same time, we're hearing the word recession repeated over and over again. And what does that mean to us? So what I'm going to do is, and, and uh, Todd did a great job of introducing um, David today. David was someone who helped me back in 2008 when I was helping a lot of you 
uh, you know, come back from that debacle from 2007 through 2008. Uh, he helped me. He was a, my consultant. He was an, uh, a voice in my ear. I paid him to help me understand the things I didn't understand. And for 10 years, I tried to get him to work at KCM. About two and a half years ago, he decided that, all right, I'll come work there, but this is what I need from you. I need you to put together a crack research team. I need you to put together a crack content team because I want to make sure that what we're delivering is the best anyone could get. So we met David's demands and we put together, instead of being a couple of people at KCM now, it's 26 people. And instead of me hiring David, David is now my boss because my son bought the company and told me to go work for David. That's how much my son thought of me. So right now I'd like to introduce David, my boss, and really the brains behind the operation. <laughs> well, thank you, Steve. And, uh, you know, uh, I was thinking back as you were talking about that, about 2008, and, and it's very similar today to what we saw different, but, and we'll, we're going to talk about that in just a minute, but a lot of questions that people have that there aren't a lot of you know, quick answers for, and, and one of these is recession. So I want to start there and, and, and we'll talk a little bit about that, even that last slide you saw where you show the dip down in GDP. So let's start this conversation with really the technical definition of a recession or the widely held definition of a recession of two consecutive quarters of negative or constricting GDP meaning business is slowing down. A recession is nothing more than an economic slowdown. And, and what we know is no matter where we are in the country today, all across the country, um, we see businesses slowing down. We see restaurants, we see other, you know, you know, establishments where people can't come together and be close and, you know, be in a movie theater, be in uh, another place where they're afraid the contraction of the coronavirus is going to happen. So we've shut those businesses down, literally put the economy on pause. And Steve, you mentioned the slide yesterday, or I mean, uh, the slide that you just uh, used, the advice of this, this drop down, which are projections right now. First quarter is still a projection. This will be the last day. We'll see the first look at GDP uh, in this country tomorrow. The, the initial estimates will be released, but they're calling for that to be negative. And then we're talking about this swift ride down here in the second quarter where we know a lot of businesses have been placed on pause. So the question of are we going into recession, you know, from a technical standpoint will not be answered until the end of the second quarter, but I think we'll look back on this time and say we are in a recession, we were in a recession at this time. And that's going to heat up as GDP again comes out this week and, and a lot more people are talking about it. But what we can confidently say in that is recession does not equal housing crisis. But, but I want to talk just a minute about why that may come up for people. And I pulled a quote here from Mark Fleming from First American. And he says, many still bear scars from the Great Recession and may expect the housing market to follow a similar trajectory in response to the coronavirus outbreak. But there are distinct differences that indicate the housing market may follow a much different path. And while housing led the recession in 2008 and 2009, this time it may be poised to bring us out of it. So what's Mark saying there? Um, you know, when you, you live through 2008, whether you're in our business, you're in the real estate business or not, we all remember it. And there was a lot of hurt uh, in that time period. There was a lot of job loss, economic loss, people lost homes and, 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 and people were hurt. And with, what you know is, is when you're hurt, you expect in a lot of times to be hurt again. And, and, and what Mark's saying here is as people hear this talk of recession, it's very logical to go back to, well, here's 2008 all over again. Here's a, a housing collapse. And it's what we, you know, we remember based on what he calls the scars of the Great Recession. And so it's worth noting as we have this conversation and we communicate uh, to people that we serve out in the market. And I want to bring in this other quote from Doug Bryan. It says, with the exception of two recessions, the Great Recession from 2007 to 2009 and the Gulf War Recession of 1990 to 1991, no other recessions have impacted the U.S. housing market according to Freddie Mac's Home Price Index. And that's data going all the way back to 1975 till today. And so what he's saying there is when we go all the way back and we look at this data, we see two recessions, according to Freddie Mac's data, that negatively impacted the housing market, meaning where we saw depreciation. So what our team did there is we went and looked at CoreLogic's data as well, 
and graph this. And what you can see here, this is home change or price change over the last five recessions in this country. And what do we all remember? Kind of going back to Mark's quote, 2008, where we lost almost 20% of value in homes across this country. But then if you look at the four recessions prior to that, we only see one, which again was mentioned as well in the, in the previous quote in 1991, where we lost, uh, a pre, where we depreciated in home values across this country. But what do we see in, in those other three? We saw appreciation. So it's easy to make the case here that recession does not equal a housing crisis or housing depreciation. We've seen uh, history and we have this example to be able to show people right now. So, so guys, can I interrupt for just one, one yeah. second? I just, want to, I just want to play devil's advocate and I can see that we're getting some comments and some questions that are coming through. Mm -hmm. um, specifically to, okay, this is great, um, but similar to 2008, we're in unprecedented times. We've never been in this before. Sure. So, so how can we make the comparison? And then the other, the other piece to this would be the consumer confidence component, right? So, so even if, even if the, uh, so there, there's a segment of the population that believes that we're going to go back to work a little bit too early and we're going to see an uptick in the number of coronavirus uh, cases. So it, even if that doesn't happen, there is this, there's this, this um, consumer confidence issue that we're all grappling with. Is this baked in or are we waiting to see what is going to happen with consumer confidence? Well, I, I, so the question is this baked into this, this is historical data. So this is looking back on prior recessions. Yeah, so no, David, let me, let me just handle that. Yeah, yeah. Right, sorry. let me just handle that for a second. The, what winds up taking place is the fact that part of the consumer confidence challenge is if you get bit by a dog and then you see the next dog, you assume you're going to get bit again. So what they're seeing is that, all right, people are having challenges as far as employment, and we're gonna cover that at length in a second, all right, the whole employment situation. But really what I think the consumer confidence issue really is right now is they're assuming, they're making the assumption that if we run into another recession, it's gonna be like 2008 again. So the first thing that David wanted to show you was just understand recession doesn't mean there's a housing crash. In the last five recessions, there was one in 2008 because housing caused that crash. All right. In the other five, only one time did it go down less than 2%. But that does not mean that the consumer is just going to say, oh, okay, that's fine. What we now have to do, because consumer confidence is up to us. If we, if we have agents sitting on the sideline afraid to say what's taken place, consumer confidence will continue to deteriorate because somebody else is controlling the narrative. What we need to do is we need to control the narrative. So what David did do is say, all right, there are all going to be people who are going to say, I don't care what you say. This is like 2008. I get a feeling, you know, people losing their jobs. This is just not a good economy. And we know what happened the last time. Mm -hmm. So let's let David go through the comparison right now from now to 2008 and why we don't think housing is going to be here. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about the housing itself and what that means. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, I, I love yeah. it. And, and I just want to make sure everybody that's watching, listening right now, hear what he's saying, that it is our responsibility to be prepared to answer these kinds of questions that I just thrown out that, that are coming through the chat box. Right now, they're going to get into specific data points that you can be the knowledge broker. You can be the trusted advisor. Be taking notes right now. Thanks, guys. And, and the one thing I'll, I'll do before I let David go, you shouldn't wait until I ask the question. You have to get this information out now. You know, I'll give you a simple example. When the last existing home sales report came out and it was devastating, like you were, we're off like, you know, whatever it was, 43%. And everyone got crazed about, agents got crazed about that. Ladies and gentlemen, who didn't already know that? 94% of the company, country was in a shelter in under a shelter in place order. We all knew that sales were not gonna be what they were last year. That was not news. But somehow that, that knowledge created a hysteria. We have to get them out there. We have to be, like I said before, tell them the truth and trust their, their intelligence. We're going to have some crazy headlines coming up over the next you know, 45, 50 days. But if we stay ahead of those headlines instead of behind those headlines, then it's not like, oh, wait a second, that's shocking. It's like, oh, no, my realtor, thank God I have my realtor. They kind of explained to me what was going to happen. 
that's and and and, and I, I appreciate Peter that you said it's our, our professional responsibility. I'll say it's our moral obligation. Again, I said that to get that information out. Now, Dave is going to give you some great stuff that you can share on social media on anything that you're doing. If you're doing Zoom calls, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. You know, some of the things you can do to to control the narrative, not control it in a like a Pollyanna way, but let's just get the truth out there because we know. You know, I grew up in New York City. And there was a, a guy named Jimmy Breslin who, who was a reporter there. And he's a rough and tumble guy, like a Columbo guy, rough thing. But he was a great, great reporter. And he had a great line. He said, the, the whole business of television is to get you to watch more television. So guess what sells, especially in our society today? Something negative. It's our responsibility to get the truth out there because negativity is going to control the narrative we don't. Go ahead, David. Yeah. So, so I think in response to that question, talking about, you know, finishing this topic of, of why recession does not equal housing crisis, let's go and look at 2008 and answer this question. You know, is this going to be 2008 all over again? And so what our team at KCM did, uh, and Steve mentioned the research team and the content team that puts all of this together, is went and looked at data points comparing this market today to 2008. And again, to Steve's point earlier, being able to get this information out ahead of those questions is key, but, but also to use them in answering those questions. So the first one uh, we want to look at here is home appreciation. So in this slide right here, you can just see it. It tells a story. On the left side are the six years leading up to 2008, and on the right side are the six years leading up to today. And so when you look at it, you can see that leading up to 2008, we had much higher appreciation than what we've seen coming in the six years leading to today. And even at that time, I would argue we had runaway appreciation, almost like uh, we're, we're watching a movie and you know we know a runaway train is, is coming, and that's, that's bad news. And, and that bad news led to a lot of the issues that we faced in 2008. As a matter of fact, leading up to today, the highest level of appreciation in 2017 is not even equal to the lowest level of appreciation we saw heading into 2008. So big differences in today's market versus uh, the market we saw in 2008 with regard to appreciation. The second piece, of information we want to look at here is home um, is mortgage data, uh, mortgage credit availability, meaning how easy is it to obtain financing? And for that, we use the Mortgage Bankers Association Mortgage Credit Availability Index. It's published every month. Uh, and the simple way to, to understand this is the higher the index, the easier it is to get a loan. And you can see it here back. Uh, it, during the housing bubble, it was very easy to get a loan. We often made the joke there, it was hard not to get a loan back then. And if you were in the business, you, you remember that. And then what we saw was this pendulum swing with guidelines and requirements for people to obtain financing to buy a home. And, and really since then have largely stayed uh, there. And even visually, you can see it that we're nowhere near where we were coming into 2008 with regard to credit availability. Because that question comes up, you know, maybe from someone that says, um, I've heard it's as easy today to, to get a loan as, as it was back in 2008 or leading up to the housing crash. And, and this visual shows you that's just not true. The next piece of data that we want to take a look at is inventory. In, in this image really tells a picture of the difference between uh, the market then and the market today. And what you can see there is back in 2008, we really had an oversupply of homes on the market for the number of people that wanted to buy them using this idea of a balanced market being six to seven months. And that oversupply of homes then led to a lot of the issues that we faced in the housing crisis. And what do we know today? We entered this year with the biggest issue we started this year with that we thought was going to be the biggest issue for our business being inventory. Literally, you know, not enough homes on the market for the number of people that want to buy them. Now, that's going to vary from, from area to area and also by price point. But heading into this crisis, we know that uh, nationally, we had about three months of inventory uh, on hand uh, for, for those that wanted to buy it. 
And so a big difference, again, inventory and oversupply, a big reason that, that we saw some of the challenges that we saw in 2008. Hey, David. So, yeah, go ahead, Tom. So, so help, help me with the dialogue Mm -hmm. that we're getting right now. And, and by the way, I love the, the, the statement that TV's job is to get you to watch more TV, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what we're hearing from, let's call it the pundits, right? Is that they're saying, hey, listen, it's bad. It's bad that we don't have any inventory. This is going to lead us into a deeper recession, maybe even a U-shaped shaped recession. But yeah, we look at the data and the data would say, hey, listen, actually the U-shaped recession was a result of more inventory, not less. Help me with the dialogue. So when we look at that, a couple of things to talk about on our U-shape. The technical definition, if you want to go back to a U-shape, is a slow decline in. What we saw was a swift decline, you know, with the economy being put on pause. The, the, and, and so when we look at V versus U, it's, it's really this, this sharp decline down. And then there are a lot of questions to be answered, just like we talked about, on our economy coming back online. Goldman Sachs uh, released a, a statement, uh, I think it was last week or the week before, mm -hmm. saying what really policymakers are trying to do is thread the needle, meaning bring the economy back online, but also dealing with people's fears. But, but let, let me say this about that direct question, Todd. There is a reason the federal government is injecting billions of dollars into our industry, and here's it. They realize the effect that housing has on our economy and literally the ability of housing to pull us out of this recession. We published uh, a study, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, you can go back to the KCM website and see it, um, of the economic impact by state of one home sale. And so as we look at that and people say, um, you know, the issues that we're having right now and, and you know, this, this inventory issue, and Steve's going to talk about this in just a minute, starting this, to see what's happening in the market right now. But as we get out there, as transactions can happen, and, and certainly with local and state guidelines and doing those the right way, our business, we have the ability to be a critical piece of pulling this country out of the, out of the economic downturn. And can I say something here too, too Todd? The, uh, I want everyone to understand that housing is going to determine how this economy shakes out. How quickly come back is going to be dependent on how quickly housing comes back. And how quickly housing comes back is in the hands of the people on this call. There's no Calvary. There's nobody going to bring the housing market back. There's no one going to go get, get those listings. There are nobody that's going to sell those listings but us. So there, I think there are some agents saying, well, look at all this thing that's happening. We have to wait for the Calvary to come. Everyone understand where the Calvary everyone else is waiting for. There's no second Calvary. It is us. And in probably the best example I saw that was this morning. Probably the toughest governor in the country as far as keeping everything shut down is Michigan. Those agents don't have their hands tied behind their back. They're in straitjackets. But she came out this morning saying that the first thing she's going to open up, and hopefully in a week, is new construction. Because what David just said is true. The quickest way to get the economy going, and she understands that, is let's start building houses. And guess who has to buy those houses? People who currently live in houses. And guess what has to happen to the houses they currently live in? We have to sell them. Yeah. So this is exactly where we're at right now, and that's the reason we're on this call. I understand Cowell Banker. I had a 550 agent company in 2004 that I sold. I sold it to Cowell Banker. The reason I did that is I wanted my agents to have the best brand they could find to make their job easier on the transition. There's a flight to quality right now. People are looking to you right now. There are other companies that had all this, you know, client panache and headlines over the last couple of years. The people who own those companies, those VC guys, 
that put the money in and own those companies, they're in some virtual boardroom right now trying to figure out how to cut expenses. The owners of your company live in your neighborhoods, they live in your regions. They're worried about your neighbors, they're worried about your neighborhoods, they're worried about your regions. That's what Coldwell Bank is all about. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll just say one more time. If you're sitting around waiting for the Calvary, you got this thing screwed up. You gotta get, get, get on a horse, get the rest of the agents in your, in your office, the rest of the agents in your, the other coal banker offices are next to you and the town's next to you. And you gotta go start rescuing people now. That's what this is about. And I, and I know I kind of got off so on the brilliant. tangent. I apologize, Todd. No, I mean, that, you, well, we've been talking about that for the last two weeks, right? I mean, the absence of leadership in, a, in, in, in our industry, this unknowing, this distrust of the data, the facts, um, the fact that the television really isn't giving us um, a consistent truth, if you will. Um, I love that we are the Calvary. Like, that is absolutely brilliant. Uh, we talked a little bit last week about how you know, we are all in the same storm, but we're in different boats. Um, and that that is seen right now. We have to be in our big, massive, you know, ironclad rescue boat telling the story that you guys are providing us with all the details. So, so that is just absolutely wonderful. Well, while I have you just, can I ask one, a couple of questions? I've got some pouring in sure. here. Um, yeah. one, one question I've gotten, David, this is probably to you, um, is when, when you were showing the slide that showed the V-shaped recovery, Wells Fargo was showing, they were, they were sort of the anomaly. Is there, is there a reason, do you think, behind that? Well, what they're talking about there is in the third quarter, Wells Fargo is saying we'll still see a little bit of a dip. Um, so, I mean, I think the anomaly there is they are one out of these four financial institutions that's saying that. And does that mean that, that the other three are right or, or they're right or the other is wrong? No, what we're looking at there is most uh, economic experts agree, and here's what I would focus on, is that in the second half of this year, we're seeing a rebound. Now, what that looks at, you know, exactly like, we don't have a crystal ball, but I think realizing that the economy is coming back online, we're able to do things that we weren't able to do in this downward, you know, kind of kind of drop will cause the economy to grow. And so I think they're, you're, you're just seeing projections there. Some saying, may it take a little bit longer. Others saying, hey, I think we're going to rebound. Uh, quicker. All right, David, there are questions right now, if we can see the slide. Uh, could, can you get that slide back or is that going to really screw you up? No, I can bring it back. Give me All just right. a second. Ladies and gentlemen, yeah. before the slide comes up, I'll tell you really what the Wells Fargo thing is. They don't think we're going to have as bad a drop. So they're not saying that we're going to have as big a recovery. If you look at the orange bars right here, they think in the first quarter, we're actually going to be in a positive. We'll know that tomorrow, whether they were right about that or not. But they still don't see as big a drop. So obviously, if they don't see as big a drop, they're not going to show as big a recovery. That's why the orange bars, are, it's not that they're different. They're just saying that it was not going to be as bad early. And if it's not as bad early, it's not going to be as good late. All right. That's really what that's saying there. So the, and, and this is important, not that they get this right. Just like we talked about the great oncologist, they don't save every patient. Every one of the patients is not a cancer survivor. Just like the great attorney, they don't win hundred percent of their cases. But the thing is, is not whether you, they're going to, are they going to be hundred percent right? The thing is, what are the chances them versus somebody else's advice? <laughs> That's what you have to take a look at. This is the best advice we can give at this time. All right. And this is the advice. And again, I'll say this, that many of your clients are hearing right now. If they're getting reports from any one of the four major people, and a lot of your clients are, all right. They're being told that, hey, listen, it's going to be really rough. It's going to be a downward slide for the next couple of months while we figure this thing out. But the, the American economy is going to come back. Now, David, I, I'm going to do something terrible to you. All right. All right. I'm going to take over a little bit because we're losing time and I want to get through everything. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. You don't mind doing that? No, no, no. Go All ahead. Right. This is what I want you to do. What David can show you and you're going to get to see how, how are we working this out with the slides, David? We'll send those over to you, Todd, and, and, and Peter, will, and you guys. All right, so you're going to get all the everybody. slides, guy. yeah. you guys. We, can't, we don't have the time to go through them because you had some great questions. And if I didn't think the questions were great, I wouldn't have taken the time to answer them. I would have said, no, let's keep on going with the presentation. They were great questions. I'm glad you asked. All right. 
But what David could will also, when you get to slides, 53.8% of the houses in this country uh, have over 50% equity in them. 37% are owned free and clear. The houses that do have a mortgage on them, $177,000 is the, the average equity. So what happened in 2008, everyone was using a house as an ATM. They were buying jet skis, a new car, lavish vacation. Well, people now said, no, we're not gonna do that. They've learned over the last 10 years. What happened in 2008, as soon as prices faulted at all, people went to negative equity, they walked. Nobody's gonna walk away from, first of all, there's no foreclosure on a free and clear house. That's one third of them. And nobody's walking away from $177,000 worth of equity. That's cash to them. So I want, want you to get that. Go to the, uh, the, the, the slide where she has her finger over her mouth. Okay. Now I'm going to tell everyone, you can't share these slides. As a matter of fact, the next slide we're not even going to give you because we're afraid you're going to share it. This is for information purposes only. All right. We're going to show you a breakdown. Go ahead, David. This is the breakdown of the first 701,000 people that lost their jobs. So what you see is 59.5% were food services and drinking places, service and bartenders. They're going to get their jobs back. Now, there's going to be social distancing. But remember, every business, people are saying, well, business is not going to come back. The only business that's not going to come back is a business that didn't serve a, a, um, a demand of the marketplace. If they didn't serve a need of the marketplace, they were going out of business anyway. So it might be that, well, in one restaurant, you can't fit as many people. Same amount of people are going to want to go to dinner. That means they're going to go to dinner across the street in a new restaurant. All right. The construction workers, we already know they're coming back. The healthcare office workers, those are the people who work in dentist offices and doctor's offices in the emergency medical centers that have been closed down. People can't go see a dentist right now. All of those people are coming back as quickly as they can. Childcare workers, anyone who has a kid at home right now, they'll pay childcare workers extra money to come back to work once they're allowed to. Now, the temporary help services, that's going to be a challenge. We thought retail stores, that's what we named it Orange, was going to be a challenge. It kind of looks like in China, that might not be the case at all. People came back shopping. In the accommodation industry, airlines, hotels, we have to see on that. But the reason I don't want you to share this slide is up in the upper right-hand corner, it says up until 314. This was the survey taken on 314, which, again, covered the first 701,000. Since then, about 22 million people got laid off. About eight days from today, or nine days from today, on May 8th, the new BLS report comes out. It only comes out once a month. We'll update this slide. You need the updated slide. That one will want you to run with. Because you can understand now that, wait a second, all these people have lost their jobs? A lot of them are coming back to work immediately. <laughs> It's not like it was in 2008 that people lost their job for an extended period of time. And ladies and gentlemen, go to the 80-20 slide, uh, David. If 20% of the people, and that's what we anticipate is going to be the unemployment rate when it's announced on May 8th, somewhere around 20%. Understand if 20% of the people lost their jobs, that means 80% still have their jobs. Let's get that through our heads. 80% of the people still have their jobs. They can still buy a house. They can still do the things that they want to do. So if we're going to have a fall off, and we have to remember 20% of those people, 20% of those people, many of those jobs were low salary jobs. They weren't going to buy a house anyway. The 16 year old that was working at McDonald's got laid off. That's in that 20% number. He wasn't going to buy a house. He's living with mom and dad. So now let's take a look now at unemployment rates. The orange line that you see here is the Goldman Sachs, uh, I'm sorry, is the uh, JP Morgan projections. They're the most dire projections. They think it's going to go down to 20, down 20%. JP Morgan thinks it's going to go down 15%. But then you see the recovery they're talking about. They're talking about full recovery the end of next year. Look what happened in, 2000, in uh, the 2006 and 2016. There were nine years for us to get back to the same employment number. 
in the Great Depression, and people are saying, well, the Great Depression, this is like that. It's going to, well, no, it's not. It's nothing like that. It took them 12 years, and they bottomed out on, 20, on the 20%, over 20% unemployment for five years in a row. That's not happening here. The market's going to come back. It's going to come back more quickly. Now, do we know if it's going to come back the end of this year, the first or second quarter of next year? That's the argument. The argument is not, is it going to come back this year or 2022? The argument is going to be, is it going to be back by the end of this year? Or is it going to be back by the beginnings of next year? All right, that's the argument. And we have to be prepared, ladies and gentlemen. So let's jump to the next question. What do you need to do right now? Probably the thing that's most important that we do right now and jump right to the slide, the first showing time slide, David. This is North America. This is the number of showing people that are actually looking to purchase, you know, to, to see a house, either a visual showing or an, a, a live showing. And there are many parts of the country that are still doing live showings, by the way. If you're not in that category, there are. That's already bottomed. Our business, our industry has already bottomed. We're coming back out the other side already. And that curve has got to leave. Did I mention we're the Calvary? Did I bring that up yet? We have to lead the rest of the economy out. And the, the purchases are already making that determination. And if we go to, you can go to the Show and Time website, go to the next slide, David. Here's just Colorado. And almost every state I look at says the same thing. We already bottomed out. Our challenge right now is not that the buyers are not slowly coming back. Our challenge is we're not getting the listings to sell to them. The same challenge we had at the beginning of the year. As a matter of fact, Zillow just reported, I don't care if you like Zillow or don't like Zillow, some agents think they're, you know, God, some agents think they're the devil incarnate. I'm not worried about that, I like their data. Pending sales turned positive in a week ending April 15 and is up 6.2% week over week as of the seven days ending April 19th. We're doing a company on Thursday. They just gave us all their data. They think things are bad. Their pending sales have turned the curve already, heading positive again. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in good shape now. This is all we need to do. We have to take the panic out of the market, that consumer confidence that Todd just talked about. We're the ones that have to change that. And the first thing we have to do is we have to make sure that when a headline comes out that we already knew was going to come out, that when the un unemployment numbers come out next week, everyone's going to go, oh, my God, it's a 20%. We know it's going to be that. I'm telling you today it's going to be that. Let's tell our consumer it's going to be that. Tell them the truth, trust their intelligence. But then give me the calm down slide. This is what I want you to, I'm going to give you seven words right now. There's nobody from New York on here, right? Todd, is there anybody from New York on here? I'm sure there's plenty of people from New York here. And I no, no, they're, this, they're, they're working in New York right now. All right, if there are people from New York, I'm going to give everyone else seven words. The people in New York understand that in New York, we say, calm the F down. We put the F in the, in the middle there, right? But I'm going to give you the, the cleaner version. Calm down, sit down, think, plan, act. It's that simple, ladies and gentlemen. And put that over your desk in your house right now. Every time you get a negative headline, every time you get some negative thing thrown at you, before you panic, calm down, sit down, think about it, plan and act. I got two emails in the last three days. One of them was saying, the Fed president just said this is going to be a long recession. I said, really? Powell said that? So I immediately, he gave me a link. I immediately went to the... the, the it was from 2009, Ben quoting Ben Bernanke. The agent got all crazed about a headline that was 11 years old, not thinking it was for today. Another person who saw a, a, a headline that was very positive say, do you agree with everything this guy's saying? And when I checked the link, I said, yes, I do, because I wrote that article. Guys, don't read the headlines and get crazed. Would you please read what it's saying? Calm down, sit down, think, plan, act. Because ladies and gentlemen, go to the three, Dave Prospect, because we're running out of time quickly here. 
You get paid to do three things. In our industry, I owned a 550 uh, agent real estate company, 13 offices. So I'm not talking from like some book that I read this in. I was an agent for eight years, the top agent in my county for seven of those eight years. You get paid in this business for three things, prospecting for leads, nurturing those leads, and closing those leads. That's what you get paid to do. Now, in some of your markets, not all of them, in some of your markets, number three is fading a little bit because you're under constraints and buyers and sellers are somewhat under constraints. There is no constraint on number one and number two. So if number three is slowing up a little bit, even though it's coming back, it's still slower than it normally would be, then we have to double down on one and two. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna tell you, double down on listings. The buyers are already coming back. Every state they're coming back. Every company we do, where we're doing an individual company that'll give us the individual numbers, they're shocked when I put it on a graph, they say, I didn't think we were doing that good. Yeah. And that's where half your agents still hiding under the bed. Get that other half agents working and we're going to be fine. Did I mention moral obligation? If you're worried about the economy, this is what I need you to do. Prospect for every single listing you can get right now. That's what you can do. Don't worry about the pandemic. You're not going to find a vaccine. Don't worry about when the restaurant's going to open up because you're not opening the restaurant. This is what you can control. The single most important part of the American economy right now is housing. As David said, that's why they're putting billions of dollars into it. Trillions of dollars into it. Let's do our part on that. David, go to the four things. All right. This is what you need to do right now. Make your message simple and effective. You can re- re- well, hold on, David. Leave it right there. Leave it right there. The, uh, make it simple. It's like, you can go over this right now. I try not to use any word that's more than two syllables when we're in a market like this. This is not the time to look impressive. This is the time to be understood. The, the goal of communication right now is not to look impressive. The goal is to be understood. Keep your message simple and effective. Number two, remain hypercurrent on all housing information. I mean hypercurrent. Because they're going to come at you. The naysayers are going to come at you when you have to stay on top of what's happening. No panic. Number three, mix micro data with your macro data. Let them know what's happening in your marketplace. There are some consumers that don't think houses are selling. Let them know that there are houses pending right now in your marketplace. Let them know there are new listings coming in your market right now. Give them the numbers. Because there are people sitting back saying, well, nobody's selling a house. I'm not going to either. Well, no, let's let them know that, yes, people are putting their house on the market. And guess what? Amazing. Some of them are selling. Number four, use videos on uh, social media and Zoom with your CRMs. You have to get these messages out. We're giving you these slides. They're perfect. You can have different Zoom meetings on the different subjects that we covered today. You have to do that, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a choice. This is not like everything's going to be okay. We have to make sure we do that. And David, go to this last thing. Uh, Try KCM. I'm going to tell you right now, I don't really sell KCM hard ever. But it's $25 a month. From now until the end of the year, it's going to be a $200 investment. This is what I know is going to happen from now until the end of the year. We're going to battle through a pandemic. We're going to work after a pandemic. And once we take our breath on that, we're going to have the most contested presidential election in the history of our country. For the next eight months, you have to stay on top of things that are happening. It's $200 for the rest of the year. You pay us $25 a month. Go there and join us right now. You will not believe the amount of information. Look at the information we're giving you free. Imagine the information and the depth we go into it when you remember. All right? And I'm going to finish with this because I think I have two minutes left. All right. Do we get shut down, Peter, at the, at the top of the hour? No. We're good. Another bit of time? We're good. Right. This is what I think of Colwell Banker. I'm going to go to beer. Because when Arthur Guinness decided in 1759 to open a brewery, he signed a lease for a four acre site in downtown Dublin. What were the terms of that lease? 
45 pounds a year for 9,000 years. What did he communicate to every single one of his competitors? We're not going anywhere. What did he communi communicate to every single person he was trying to recruit from another brewery? You can come work here. We are not going anywhere. What did he say to every single customer? Enjoy it. We'll be around. We're not going anywhere. And what did he do to every vendor? Every new business has a tough time maybe paying those first bills. What did he communicate to every vendor? Don't worry about us. We ain't going anywhere. When my son, a couple of years ago, my younger son, Stephen, he said he wanted to go visit the historic sites in Europe. He asked me to help fund that, that trip, which I did. The first picture I got back was from this brewery. That was the, his first historic site he went to, a beer brewery. But he wanted to let me know that that lease that was signed in 1759 is still on the lights, on the glass. First thing you see when you walk in. They made a commitment there. And right now, they have probably the best one-minute video. If you haven't seen it, please go see it. You can Google it on the We Will Toast Again, where they talk about, hey, listen, guys, eventually we'll be back. We'll see you in the pubs. We'll make sure the bartenders are okay. We'll support them in every way we can. And at the end of that one-minute video, guess what they say? And don't worry about us. We're not going anywhere. Give it back to me, David, for a second. Ladies and gentlemen, Cobalt Banker is Guinness. You've been around since 1906. You helped this country through World War I, World War II, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, and every other war. You helped them through several different recessions. The people in your communities know you're not going anywhere. You're not pulling deals that you made with people. You're not hoping that the VC in a, this virtual boardroom board is gonna make the right decision for your neighbors. Your leaders are worried just about your, same amount about your neighborhoods and your neighbors and your regions. There's a flight, a distinct flight to quality right now. And just like Guinness, the one thing Cobalt Bank knows they can say, you can trust us. We ain't going anywhere. Understand who you work for. Understand your brand. Understand the power of that brand. And understand that you're the Calvary. Stop waiting for something to happen. Make something happen. And we would love to at KCM, right alongside you. We're pretty good as a you know, sidekick. We're real good as a sidekick. Sign up today, and we'll ride alongside you to the next eight months. Thank you, Todd. Oh, wow. Cool. Todd, All right. Todd, I'm ready we, to go to war, baby. I'm ready to go to war. Todd, we should just end it with that. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like just, just incredible, Steve. And er, Yeah. There's, you know, it's funny because we, we take notes as we go along because we want to recap at the end. I, I got too many notes, man. We'd be here for another half an hour with all of the incredible value. Um, here's what I would ask everybody on this call to do, right? Um, let's, let's, make, let's make Dave and, and Steve's day. I want you to go to Instagram, Keeping Current Matters. I want you to go to Facebook, Keeping Current Matters. I want you to post on their social media sites what you thought about this presentation. If you thought it was amazing, tell them. If you thought that it, somebody else needed to, to hear it, not only tell them, but share it. Like What these guys are providing us is exactly what we need to hear, exactly what we need to know so that we can go out and have an impact on the economy. We are the Calvary. I love that. That's incredible. And, and I will tell you, if you haven't done so already, you, you need to subscribe to these, all these, not only do you get a video, but you get all of the slides one by one. We of course are gonna deliver these slides to you guys, but it's an incredible tool for each and every one of you, true professionals to be dictating what the narrative is going to be. Steve, David, thank you. Thank you for having us.
David, am I fired because I ran over you a little bit there? Are you going to fire me this later this afternoon? That's all I want to know. No, it's great. That's great. And Todd, we're going to get these to you for everybody to get out. And like you said, share this message. Tag us. We'll, we'll, we'll share it as well. We'll help you get the message out. Because now more than ever, being able to bring this information to the market is where the difference is made. Amen. Crushed it. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, you guys. Hey, listen, this is all I can say. I want you to do two things. Try KCM, 14 days free. Just try it. You'll see what we're talking about. Try KCM.com. Do that, please. It's the only time I've ever sold it in eight years. You need it for the next eight months. You can cancel it in January. Just do it for the next eight, eight months. And yeah. the second thing I'll say is take to heart what I said about the Calvary. We need to help people right now in a really big way. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Everybody have a great day. Thank you.